If you go ahead and turn over to John chapter 17, we're going to work through five verses, but I've got to tell you, I'm, I'm pretty full from that worship. That is fantastic stuff. And you might think that uh, from the screen, the title of the message today, Jesus Really Lived, you might think that we'll bring an apologetic, a defense of Jesus' life that he actually lived, he actually existed, and that's why we're worshiping who we worshiped a moment ago. Uh, you could say that and you'd be absolutely accurate. But the idea of Jesus really living is more than the reality of his life. What we'd like for you to consider today is the focus of his life. Because we have a tendency to think that Jesus Christ, we come to worship, but he's so far away from and elevated from how we could possibly live that it's an arm's length. We don't see how he's called to walk in his shoes. Now, certainly, he's the Savior. He's God among us. But thinking about the pattern, thinking about the priority, is for you how exactly he lived. And very often, we don't think Jesus Christ lived a, an adventurous, an exciting life. When we think of him, we think of just doing what needed to be done. But this morning, I'd like you to consider and run your life over his in a way of how are you living in relationship to how he lived. Now, I've got to tell you, when I was younger, I never thought that Jesus Christ was somebody who lived an exciting, adventurous life. I never did. Matter of fact, when I was seven years old, if you'd have asked me uh, who my hero was between seven and ten, uh, there would have been one clear winner who was at the front of the line of the type of life that I wanted to live, uh, an exciting life, an adventurous life. Uh, I would have given you really two words, first name, last name. His name was Evil Knievel. <laughs> Not with an I evil, with an E I didn't know much about it then. I thought about, what a life. Think about this guy jumping, jumping cars. That's fantastic. I actually had a bike that I put decals. Evil Knievel. I had the little motorcycles. I had the little the guys who had the little uniforms. Matter of fact, on October 25th, 1975, I remember watching Evil Knievel jump 14 buses. 14 buses. That was it. That's what I wanted to do. Got my friends in the neighborhood. We put up garbage cans. We were launching them over our bikes over those things. I actually have a scar on my body from one of those jumps. I jumped 28 feet. Set the record in the neighborhood. But like Evil Knievel, uh, did you know he holds the Guinness Book of World Records for the most broken bones, uh, 433 broken bones. And I thought this guy was the apex of adventure. And then he took it up another level, not only jumping buses and cars and water fountains at Caesars, but then he actually made what's called the Sky Cycle. Let's see this up here, the Sky Cycle. He built this thing, it was a rocket ship of sorts, uh, with his uniform, and he was going to jump over Snake River Canyon. How many remember that? Man, that was fantastic. We lived back in those days, didn't we, people? <laughs> if you remember the jump, he didn't make it. Uh, there's a picture, though, of him trying to make it. He takes off, but if you remember, uh, something happened that the uh, parachute came out. He didn't make it over. They said he probably would have died if he would have made it over because they didn't have a whole lot of planning back then. Engineering was <laughs> cut a little bit short. But you know, as I think about people like Evil Knievel, we think about people like that, at least I did, how he really lived adventurous, but no one really thinks about that when they think of Christ. They just don't. They don't think Jesus Christ really lived. Matter of fact, there are some people who think the idea of religion has the idea of restriction. Maybe you're like that. Maybe you have friends. They, they look at religion and Jesus Christ like a minus sign in math. In other words, if I follow, it restricts me from being able to live the way I want to live. 
And so they, they don't follow after Christ. Is that true? This morning, I'd like to show you that's not true. That's not true at all. Some people think that those uh, rules, those minus signs in life are meant to be broken. I know people like that. They look at religion like, if you tell me not to do it, I'm meant to do it. I was kind of like that, I got to admit. I graduated from Evil Knievel and went right into rock and roll. <laughs> Reminded me, I heard a story of a, a seafood restaurant in, off Jersey, and there was a, a pier, and this seafood restaurant was on the side of the pier, and the top of the restaurant was open to the public. And so the seafood restaurant opened up, and they had these windows looking out on the Atlantic, and people would sit in their in their tables looking out in the Atlantic, and they said, man, what we don't want to have happen is people come and fish off the top of the restaurant. Because <laughs> if they fish off the top of the restaurant, you know what you're going to see? Fish going up in front of the window. You're going to look out the window, fish slamming off the window. They said, let's put signs everywhere. That's what they did. No fishing on the railing, on the wall, on the stairs going up. You know what happened? People fish like crazy. They said, this must be the best place ever to fish because they tell us not to. They came up and fish were slamming off the windows until one of the waiters said, let's take the signs down. It's amazing. People stopped fishing. I think some people look at religion like that. They look at Jesus like that. He tells us not to do something because he's holding us out on us in life. I think people are like that. This morning, what I'd like you to see is this. Jesus Christ lived the most adventurous, the most exciting life possible. The world is going to tell you, following Jesus Christ, doing things like a planting a church is, is crazy. You want to keep as many people as you can. We disagree. We think we're called to spread the fame of God by making disciples, and the most obvious result of that is to, to plant a church. We intend to plan a lot of them. Matter of fact, we would like you to consider being part of that in the future. But this is the thing. In order for us to propel in that direction, you have got to believe that Jesus Christ has called you to live a life that may not be defined by the adventurous people like Evil Knievel. It may not be a disobeying the signs. Maybe it's just seeing what Jesus Christ did and believing in him. And I guarantee you, take a step out the door and following Jesus Christ, you'll never regret it. If you're in John chapter 17, I'd like to introduce you to this idea. I'm going to read the passage, and as we read the passage, I want you to pay attention to the passage. This is at the, the last week of the life of Christ. He's right at the end. He's lived his life. He's modeled for the disciples exactly what they want him to be, them to be about, and he begins to pray. We're going to look at the first five verses of this prayer, but these five verses are power-packed when it comes to the type of life that Jesus lived and the type of the life that he invites you to. Let's go ahead and read verse 1 of John 17. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your, pro, your own presence with the glory I had with you before the world existed. A little thought here about this, this passage we're going to look at before we get into the context is that you notice those six words there that Jesus starts off, that idea of when Jesus had spoken these words, it's very, very important do we understand that context before we'll be able to mind the truths that are contained in these five verses? Uh, John puts this there in, like a little bridge. He writes this down. It's like a bridge connecting two land masses. So in order to understand what Jesus is saying, when Jesus had spoken these words, we've got to go backwards if we're going to understand what Jesus Christ is really talking about. And if you also notice um, in John 16, let's go back there, verses 25 through 33, the immediate context right before this. Jesus said this to his disciples, the hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, 
but I'll tell you plainly about the Father. And then he goes on to describing in that day, when you ask things from me, I'll give those things to you. And the Father loves himself and loves you. I came from the Father. I came into the world. And then in verse 29, notice what happens. Fascinating stuff. He says, now you are speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Now we know that you know all things. We do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe you came from God. Jesus answered them, do now believe. Underneath the text, there's this understanding uh, that we would often in our culture think, uh, when did you come to trust in Jesus Christ? And very often people have a, a date in our culture. You know, I put my hand up, I went forward. That's becoming less and less because I think people are processing, I think, a lot of ways that the disciples are. You know, you can't really put your finger on when all the disciples began to trust in Jesus Christ as their Savior. You can't. You simply don't know. There's not that moment in which Andrew puts his hand up or Philip goes forward. You just don't find it anywhere. But we know by this point in their relationship with Christ, they've moved from having questions, all of them, to absolute certainty. Now we believe. And it's at that moment, there's a transition that takes place that John builds that bridge in verse 1. In other words, Jesus Christ begins to pray in John 17 because the disciples have come to the place in life that they're absolutely convinced he is their Savior, Deliverer, and Lord. And that's why he prays this prayer specifically. And what I'd like you to do is consider how Jesus Christ now, in the first five verses, he creates a teaching that speaks right to what their life is going to be about from here on in. They've trusted in Christ. Now he's getting ready to go to the cross and he wants them to have a crystal clear understanding. What is this adventure that I've joined and I've asked you to join me on? And this is chiastic structure. A uh, chiastic structure, a fancy word, simply means it's a rhetorical, literary tool to emphasize the point of a particular passage so that when something is structured in a chiasm, when you see the structure, you're able to understand the intensity. So this morning, what we're going to do, and I ask you to think about, and you have in your teaching guide the text to the right, and this indented chiastic structure on the left, if you have a teaching guide. And you're going to see verses 1 and verse 5 relate directly to each other. It's almost like a mirror. Then you're going to see verses 2 and 4, like a mirror, talking about the same idea, but in a different angle. And verse 3 is the kicker. Verse 3 is the point of the structure. It's the, the money verse, you could say. So that's what we're going to walk through. Verses 1, 5, 2, 4, and verse 3 is where you get in on life. The way Jesus saw life. The fact that Jesus really lived. Let's look at that uh, structure here as we go. First of all, the, the theme of verses 1 and 5 is the theme of glory theme of glory. And you can see how these two things relate to one another. Very quickly, I want you to understand what glory is. Uh, glory in this passage, the root word is doxa. Isn't that, isn't that cool? Doxa church. That's what it is. What is glory though? It's the idea that in the Old Testament, whether it's a burning bush whether it's a cloud and they saw the glory of the Lord in the cloud or they see the, the glory of the Lord in a situation or the, the glory of the Lord in the Shekinah glory. Glory has the idea of something about God being revealed. In other words, when we see the burning bush, there's something about the consuming fire, the glory of the Lord that is there. We get to know who God is when we see his glory. It's kind of like, an arrow pointed to some aspect about God. That's what, that's what glory is. So we see the Shekinah glory in the temple. When it invaded the temple, after Solomon had, had uh, built the temple, all of a sudden people had to, to leave. It was consuming. 
God is consuming. God is interested in how he's represented. He fills the place. So you get to know who God is through some aspect of his glory being revealed. And notice here in verse 1, when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. So if that idea of glory is true, there's a sense. Jesus is saying, reveal me, and I'll reveal you. In other words, show the people some aspect about me, and I'll do the same thing about you. In other words, as people see me, they'll see you. There's this back and forth. Now, one of the things about this, if you study the Bible, when you see little phrases like, the hour has come, you stop right there and go, I need to figure out what he's talking about. Because if you're a reader of the New Testament, of the Gospel of John, you would know that five times before this, Jesus says his hour hasn't come. Now, that's interesting stuff. Think about it like this. Think about it almost like breadcrumbs. Throughout the Gospel of John, when Jesus says the hour hasn't come, it's like he's dropping a breadcrumb. He's dropping a breadcrumb. It's a clue. It's a hint. Something's going on that's underneath the context of my actions, underneath my teaching. You don't understand it, but there's coming an hour, but it's not yet. Matter of fact, that starts happening in John chapter 2, 1 through 5, at the wedding at Cana. If you remember the story, my hour has not yet come. It's not here, people. There's something about an hour yet to come, a moment in time that is so unique that Jesus identifies, it's not now. It's not at this wedding. John 7, 1 through 9, at the Feast of Booths, when Jesus is there, he says, my time has not yet come, but your time is always here. Talking to his, about his brothers, my time has not, not fully come. And then in John 7, 28 through 31, they're seeking to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. You see how that's weaving through that? What is this hour? And how does this relate to glory? And how does that relate to really living? It goes on, John 8, 12 through 20, where Jesus stands up and says, I am the light of the world, the festival of lights that it's called. All the lights are dimmed out. There's one light in Jerusalem. Jesus stands up in this and he says, oh, by the way, I want to let everybody know we're celebrating the fact that we're followers of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he's our light we look to. And he stands up and goes, by the way, let me tell you, I'm the light of the world. I mean, there's no mistake in it. He co-ops the whole thing. Pharisees didn't like it. They were seeking to arrest him. They said, your testimony isn't true says there in verse 20, he spoke this by the treasure, he taught in the temple, but no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. Then four different times, we have the idea the hour has come. And that occurs right around at the end of chapter 12. Because Jesus is moving into the final days of his ministry on earth. And so he moves from my hour hasn't come. Now we see in John 12, 23 through 28, Jesus says the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. So the focus of this hour, whatever's happening in this hour, it's meant to glorify the Son. In other words, you get to know the Son in a way you've never known him up until this point. He's revealed. That's the idea of glory. He's revealed. And he says this, he says in verse 27, Now is my soul troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but it was for this purpose I came into this world. Father, glorify your name. In other words, this is the hour of save me from this. No, I'm meant to go to the cross. There's going to be a revealing that happens on the cross of who am I. But what I say, save me from this hour. I don't want to go through the cross. He says, no, I've come into this world for this. And he says this then. In only two other places in the New Testament, a voice from heaven says, I have glorified it and will glorify it again. In other words, I'm going to make myself known in a way that is glorious. 
that is unique, that is like, unlike any other thing that's ever happened. This is the hour. John 13, 3. Now is the Son of Man, or 31, Son of Man glorified. God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. In other words, there's coming this moment, this hour. It's not elongated over a long period of time. It's so potent. It's so powerful that he's going to do it, and it's going to be amazing. It's going to be the essence of really living. Matter of fact, we see this idea actually playing out in our lives as well. That God does something and you get to know who he is by what he has done and thereby your relationship can deepen. He, matter of fact, says this about us in Matthew 5, 14 and 16. He talks about the fact that we're a city set on a hill. We're a light that can't be hidden. And then he says, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. This idea of glory, when you do good things, people see those good things. And then they know you're a follower of Jesus Christ. They get to know who God is through your actions. Isn't that cool? Isn't that amazing? That when we do good things for people, we find somebody is in need in, in their home or in their relationships, or maybe somebody's lost their job, and we go out of our way to help those people, and we say we're followers of Jesus Christ. Then they go, hmm, Jesus Christ must be like that. You see how that connection is made? It's the same idea in this passage. As Jesus Christ is going through his life and doing things, God is glorified. And so we see this idea of God being glorified that we get to know how holy and loving and just and merciful and kind and gracious we get to know all of that in the hour that's here. John chapter 17. And when he says there, the hour has come, glorify your son that the son may glorify you. In other words, on the cross, people are going to understand your holiness in a way they've never understood it before. They're going to understand your mercy in a way they could only have dreamed of. They're going to understand your grace and your power and your kindness and your goodness in a way that the raising of Lazarus from the dead couldn't communicate. And the way of calming the storm was amazing, but it could never be applied to the people. When it comes to the teaching, incredible. But he's wrapping up all of who he is in what's about to happen, and he says, I want to glorify you. Now look at verse 5. Same idea of glory. Now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory I had with you before the world existed. You see what's happening here in this structure, this mirror kind of structure. Glorify me in this moment. I'm going to glorify you. I'm going to reveal about you. Then give me the glory I had with you before the world was even created. In other words, in this time, it's about glory. And then I'd like to be back with you, Father, with the glory you gave me. Now, as an aside, there are some people, some people who teach that Jesus Christ isn't the God-man. They have a tendency to think he's just a teacher, uh, the best teacher who's ever lived, and he'd never tell a lie. Well, the problem is, and we're going to be studying this in the next uh, series that we're going to move through, in Isaiah 42, 8, God says, I am the Lord. I don't share my glory with anyone. And so Jesus is asking, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you. So either has a right to ask that, because he's God, the God-man. Or he can't be a great teacher. Just an aside there. So we see that idea of glory in verse 1 and 5. Now, look at verses 2 and 4. How is this glory revealed? That's the idea. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. That's verse 2. In other words, what is the mechanism by which this glory can take place? It's authority. Verse 2 speaks to authority, that he has the authority to do what he is going to do. And he's given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life. We're going to talk about that more in a moment. But notice what his authority is meant to do. Giving him authority not to make rules. Not to make you think he's all about restrictions. 
not making you think that religion is just something people do. You've got to put your time in. You know, at the end of days, you don't want to come up short. He says, no, no, you understand. His authority is meant to serve up life. And that's meant to glorify him. What kind of life? Well, look down in verse, look at verse 4. I have glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work you gave me to do. Verse 4 speaks of the work. So you've got the authority in verse 2, and then you have the work in verse 4, and that glorifies God. Verses 1 and 5, what is that work? Well, it's very interesting. He says, having accomplished the work. Having accomplished the work. Remember, we're Thursday night before the crucifixion. Jesus hasn't gone to the cross. What is he speaking about? And we've talked about this before. I think he's speaking about making disciples. You see, in Luke 6.40, it talks about the fact that the pupil or the disciple will be like his teacher. And remember what we read in John 16? They, They totally got it. They understood who Jesus Christ was. In other words, he'd poured out them. He'd filled their cup up as much as it could possibly be filled. And that's why he was talking about the Holy Spirit coming and guiding them into all truth. In other words, I've given you everything you need to know about who I am to follow me except for one thing. I've not gone to the cross. So I've accomplished that work because I have authority to accomplish that work. And that has glorified me, but yet this hour I'm going to be glorified in a way that I came here before and I'm going back to and brings us to the payoff verse in this chiastic structure. The verse that you need to understand. The people who think that Christianity is like a minus sign. The people who might think, man, starting a church, that's really adventurous and Man, that's a lot of complication, and my life is really busy right now. I got a lot of stress. I'll just play it safe. This verse is for you. Verse 3. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you've sent. This is eternal life. Now, you might think, Heaven. Jesus isn't thinking heaven. He's not. That eternal is the idea of anios. It's the word for uh, forever. But that word life is zoe. It has the idea of the quality of life. Not life yet in heaven. That's not what Jesus is talking about. He's saying imagine the most amazing life possible. And it goes forever. That's the kind of life that I want for my people. A purpose-filled, a God-centered, a vision-oriented life. This eternal life. And he says, and this is what it is, that they know you. Gnosko, no. It's the idea of they experience you. It's not a library. In other words, you get to know the facts. No. The idea of hold his hand, no. It's the idea of spend time, no. It's the long trip to the vacation house kind of no, you know? You get to know people, asking, that's no. That they know you, the only true God. And there's a myriad of these gods, these understandings that people are building their lives around. He goes, this is really life. You're the only true God, Jesus Christ, you who you have sent. In other words, if you really want to get life, it comes through me, from the Father. And it's the best life. It's the forever life. It's the, it's the life you've been longing for. And the world puts out all these under understandings of this is really living. If you live like this or money over here, this is really living. And the, the world is pushing all these different signs to you, all these different signals, all these different media. People are talking about this is really living life and this is really living life and Jesus wants to part that curtain of noise in your life. This is really living. Knowing me. Knowing the Father. And here's the thing. I've got the authority for the work. Don't be intimidated by it. And I reveal myself in the work, just like he revealed himself at the cross. We get to know who he is. And now we see his life and we say, man, I want to line my life up with yours. 
And we push the enemy away because the enemy wants to say, just like he did to Adam and Eve, did God really say? He wants to make it look like a minus sign. He wants you to think you lose when you follow Jesus. But we know from what Jesus says, we win. Because Jesus Christ is our Savior. He's our deliverer. You know, it's an amazing thing to me that God takes people like an evil Knievel who's all about himself. Matter of fact, I've told you before the story that he used to actually fly with two planes. He actually used to sit in one of his Learjets and he'd have the other Learjet fly next to him so he could see his name on the side of the plane next to him, Evil Knievel. He just thought that was so cool. He was so self-centered. But you know what started happening? His ex-wife started praying for him. She was a follower of Christ. His daughter, who became a follower of Christ, began to pray for him. There was a pastor who met him once at an airport and says, you know what, evil? You've got to understand, there's a savior from evil. And if you die in your sins, you're going to be separated. You're not going to have that life. He encouraged him. He urged him. And then he went back and told his church, would you pray for evil Knievel? And that church found out about that. It was a church in Butte, Montana. And then they told another church to start praying for him. And you know, at Bike Week in Daytona, Florida, Evil Knievel sat up in bed and God, he said, moved in his heart to realize that Jesus Christ is the Savior, the deliverer of his sins. Trusted Christ. Matter of fact, he not only trusted Christ, he got up in a church and said this to about 3,000 people that were gathered. Do not let us come with any patronizing thoughts on our mind. Oh, Jesus was a minister of the time or a biblical person or a person who believed in God, who taught us he was a teacher, a great human being. Jesus did not offer us that. Jesus didn't offer us that. He was the Son of God. He is the Son of God. And if you don't believe Jesus is that, what he says to you, you will surely die. You will die in your sins. Oh, you've got to believe. You've got to believe in Jesus Christ. And he actually had people put up their hands who believed this. And he said to the rest of the people, you've got to believe this because I believe it now. See, he found life. He found life. So this morning, we gather here in order to encourage you about not only Doxa Church, but what we're also trying to do, not only in this location, but places like Africa. We're seeking to spread the fame of God in Africa, places like in the Middle East, working in places like Colombia, Alaska. It's not only around the corner in your neighborhood that we want you to reach your friends. We want to go around the world. This is part of it because we think this is life. Because that's what Jesus Christ says. To know him. To be able to take that authority. See that work he's given us. To glorify him so people get to know who he is. Two questions I'd like you to think about. Two questions. First is this. What ways do you need to adjust how you are living to maximize your life? The enemy in the world is going to say, no, look over here. This is living. No, look over here. No, do this. No, be part of this. Jesus would say no, because he's told you what he thinks living is. How do you need to adjust? How do you need to change? You have to have the faith to believe that. If we can help you in that journey, we would love to. Whether you call Grace Fellowship home or you're just visiting, we'd love to be part of that journey to show you who Jesus is. Second question. We thank the Lord that we are receiving his grace an opportunity to plant Doxa Church. We thank that God for that life-giving opportunity. You're part of that, and we are thankful. Can we thank the Lord together for this opportunity? We ask you to consider, maybe you'd be part of Doxa, maybe even still, or part of another church plant, but here's the deal. Jesus says, get out of the bleachers, get on the field, because this is really living life. Let's pray together. Lord, we're grateful for your kindness. Grateful that you show us how your glory was revealed. Not only revealed in your life, in the crucifixion, but also 
that you were worthy of that glory because you had it before the world even began. We thank you for the reality of the authority that you have for the work that you did, and you grant that authority to us. We're able to tell people of who you are, and that authority can break strongholds and pe translate people from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And thank you that this is eternal life, to know you, to follow after you, Jesus. Thank you that you told us this, that we can believe this. And when the enemy whispers in our ear or when the world entreats us to follow after it, we can say, no, by faith, that is not life. And I want to live life in full. Thank you that you really lived. And thank you that we see that model in your life and you've saved us from our sins. And I pray that any in this room have never trusted in you, they would not leave. They would not rest until they rest in you. Pray in Jesus' name for this truth.